Hi folks, and welcome to a brief discussion of Chapter 8, Campaigns and Elections. And here are learning outcomes for the week. We'll define divided government and ticket splitting. We'll identify who runs for federal office in the United States. We'll outline how the Electoral College function and functions and consider alternatives. We'll outline the current system of campaign finance in the United States and consider needed changes. And we'll evaluate voter participation levels in the U.S. I'll start out with some trends that we see when it comes to modern American political campaigns, and there'll be a focus here on the presidency, as you might imagine. Uh, first, we're seeing longer and longer campaigns, particularly for the presidency. In many cases, people are running years in advance, um, at least informally. Uh, we see greater emphasis on money, although this wasn't as much the case in 2016. Uh, fundraising wasn't as important as it seems to have been in other recent elections. Uh, one trend that we do see, and it continued in 2016, was less emphasis on political parties. Um, it used to be that elites within the political parties played a much larger role in choosing who would get the nomination for President of the United States and other prominent um, offices. We saw that less be the case. Um, President Trump, then candidate Trump, didn't enjoy the support of elites within the Republican Party, but still managed to get the a nomination for the Republican Party. And even though Hillary Clinton did win the Democratic endorsement, uh, the Democratic nomination, um, Bernie Sanders, who had uh, never been an elite within the Democratic Party and didn't even describe himself as a, as a member of the Democratic Party, uh, was able to uh, uh, make a prominent run for that, for that nomination, as he also did in 2020. We've seen much greater reliance on professional political consultants in recent campaigns, and that means that uh, slogans are focus grouped and they're tested and positions are run, are run through political, uh, through public opinion polls to determine what messages work and, and where the population is, the voting population is on certain issues. So we see much more professionalization of political campaigns, and we see that for Congress, we see that in statewide elections, and we see it for the presidency of the United States. Now, to some extent, 2016 is an exception because President Trump, to a pretty great extent, was his own top political consultant, and he crafted language that uh, resonated with his supporters. So while he drew on um, political consultants like Steve Bannon and others, uh, he was, in many cases, his own top political consultant in many regards. Uh, we see a greater emphasis on, on uh, name recognition and candidate visibility in recent elections. So um, and we certainly saw that in 2016, where the top candidate on the Republican side and the Democratic side had high levels of name recognition. Uh, Barack Obama was a little bit unusual in 2008. You know, you wouldn't, many people didn't know who he was a year or two before he won the Democratic um, nomination. But in many cases, the candidate with more name recognition, higher levels of visibility has done better in, uh, in modern campaigns. As I mentioned before, and we discussed this last time, uh, greater use of public opinion polls, greater use of focus groups in determining where the voting population is on certain issues and how to craft language and how to craft slogans that will, um, that will provide an advantage when it comes to winning an election. And as we've also discussed before, much greater use of social media, uh, use of the internet and fundraising, but also use of Twitter and Facebook to take messages directly to voters and um, uh, not necessarily through traditional news media. Okay, let's briefly touch on eligibility for federal elected office. In all cases, the presidency, vice president, um, serving as a senator or in the House of Representatives, they all require American citizenship. Uh, the presidency requires that you are a natural born citizen. Now, what does this mean? Of course, literally, you would think, well, that means that you were born in the United States, but we've had several prominent folks who have run for the presidency and that weren't born in the United States, like John McCain, for example. His father was an admiral. Uh, he was born in the Panama Canal Zone. Both of his parents were American citizens. So while this has never been tested, it's never come before the Supreme Court, most people think that um, it's not necessary that you were born in American territory, but that uh, both of your parents were American citizens. Um, the vice president must meet the same standards as the 
president, and in both of those cases, achieve the age of 35 or older. Senate, uh, to be a senator, you have to be 30 or older, a citizen of nine years. House of Representatives, 25 or older, a citizen of seven years. So these are pretty low requirements, um, and it doesn't actually have a lot to say about who actually runs and wins. We tend to see uh, winning candidates are much older. Um, they have historically, over American history, been disproportionately wealthy, disproportionately white, uh, disproportionately male. We now have the largest percentage of women who are in the, um, the Congress at about 20%, about 20% in the House, about 20% in the Senate. But you don't have to be a mathematical genius to realize that this is, uh, doesn't represent the um, population of women as a whole in our country. And as I said before, the professional status of people who run for Congress, they are disproportionately tend to be attorneys, people with higher levels of education, higher socioeconomic status, and so forth. You know, up until the 20th century, there hadn't been much regulation of funding campaigns or campaign finance. Um, but as you get into the 20th century, the United States is, is an industrial power. The United States is uh, one of the wealthiest countries in the world or becoming one of the wealthiest countries in the world. So there's a lot of money out there, and they're certainly seeking to influence our political system, people who have it. So as we get into the 20th century, there's a number of laws and a number of attempts to regulate and limit the power of money. And of course, there's a lot of tension here because it gets to what we're often talking about in this class, you know, individual liberty, that is to use your money, your resources the way you want, and overall societal order and equality and the tension between those things. Another thing that we tend to see is each time there's a controversy, each time there's a scandal, in many cases, Congress will respond with an attempt to deal with that issue. In some ways, you can think about regulating money and politics as almost like, um, you know, responding to a leak in your basement. You know, you might patch up one leak, but if water's seeking to get in your basement, it's going to find a way. Um, so I doubt there will ever come a time where people say, okay, well, we, you know, totally dealt with the issue of money and politics and the corrosive effect it can have. So spend some time in your reading really looking over the different attempts and what you think about it and whether or not we've drawn those lines in the right place. Now, I will say that um, over the last 20 years since the um, McCain-Feingold Act, um, most of our political campaigns, particularly at the federal level, are effectively unregulated. I mean, we regulate how much people can donate to individual campaigns, but you can give unlimited amounts to super PACs or these political action committees that might support a candidate as long as there's not sort of an official relationship with the campaign. Uh, you can give unlimited amounts of money to issue advocacy advertising. Um, so, you know, while there are limits on how much that you can give or how much wealthy people can give to political parties and individual campaigns, there are loopholes essentially that you can drive a truck through. So spend some time in your reading understanding that. And this could be a good source of a news analysis paper and certainly for your discussion this week. Um, uh, do we do a good job regulating money in politics? What should we do more? Um, and is spending money on a political campaign, is that the same thing as freedom of speech? Does it deserve the same sort of constitutional protections? I'll let you all explore that in discussion this week. Uh, again, you know, I'm not going to spend a whole great deal of time on the individual details. That's what your reading is for. But there's a number of provisions to avoid the limitations of donating to individual political campaigns or individual political parties. And the Supreme Court has essentially said that when it comes to donations to a political action committee that might support a candidate but not have any direct involvement with the campaign itself or supporting charities that have a sort of a political viewpoint uh, or nonprofit organizations that have a political viewpoint, um, that expenditures are essentially unlimited. And um, we've also seen a situation too where it used to be where candidates would agree not to raise as much money and then turn to taxpayers for public financing of campaigns. They could do that in the primaries by matching um, government funding with the money that they raise for running uh, for primary elections for the presidency. And then they would decline any 
fundraising and take public financing to run for the uh, general election. In almost all cases now, and since 2008, the major party candidates have declined this public financing, and they have done so because they can raise so much more money independently uh, through super PACs and through these other organizations and through traditional means. So, you know, we're, we're just not seeing candidates use these public financing. And of course, the big issue here is that when somebody or an individual or a corporation or uh, an interest group of some kind gives a great deal of money to a campaign, they're expecting something. Of course, they want to support a candidate that might uh, reflect their policy preferences, but they are also expecting access. They expect that candidate to pick up the phone. They expect that can candidate to be receptive to their concerns. And I think we saw some of that in the NRA film that we had, to, uh, that we recently watched, uh, which was, you know, the power of an interest group of that magnitude is that um, there's a great deal of access when it comes to reaching decision makers. I touched on this already, but the race for the U.S. presidency has gotten longer and longer. One of the reasons for this is that the presidential primaries themselves have become more important. They're much more binding. It used to be that presidential pri primaries were much more just a, a, a beauty contest. It was a demonstrate. It was a way for candidates to demonstrate that they had popularity among voters. But the actual decision of who would get the party nomination, that was determined at the national conventions. It was determined in smoky rooms among party elites. And in many cases, it would defy um, the outcomes of the, of the state primaries. That's not what we see now. The state primaries now are binding. If you win a state primary, you get a certain amount of uh, delegates to go to the national convention. And even if the candidate doesn't enjoy the support of elites with the, in the political party, they can still win um, the nomination. And I think that's what, that's what we saw with President Trump in 2016. As I said before, in many cases, at least informally, um, prominent candidates or candidates start running for the presidency years before any votes are cast. And this is what they refer to in the book as the invisible primary. That's uh, lining up elite support, lining up financial support uh, for a run for the presidency. Different states run their primaries and caucuses different ways. Um, do they vote directly for the candidate? This would be a direct primary. Or do they vote for... Um, uh, delegates that will support a certain candidate, that'd be more indirect. Um, do they award the delegates that go to the national conventions proportional or winner take all? The Democrats do much more proportional. So that means that if one candidate, say Bernie Sanders, gets 50% of the vote, they get 50% of the delegates to go to the national convention. The Republicans do much more winner take all. That is that if Donald Trump wins one more vote than the other candidates, he gets all the votes from a particular state. That's one of the reasons why President Trump was um, able to lock up the nomination earlier than Hillary Clinton was in, in 2016, because the Republicans do much more winner-take-all primaries. Are they closed or open primaries? That means are they only open to their, um, are they only open to members of their own party? Uh, blanket Primaries are when you could vote for either party uh, during a single primary, but those have been ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, so check out the reading on that. A handful of states have runoff primaries, which means that if one candidate doesn't get a majority of votes in the first round of a presidential primary, um, then there will be a runoff and of the top two. And another variation of this is what they do in Louisiana, that the top two candidates will automatically go into a, um, a runoff election. And then some states, too, have conventions or political caucuses. And these are, uh, you know, they're essentially party meetings where the individual delegates are selected to go to the, to the national convention. Minnesota has caucuses as well as primaries, so they kind of do both. There's the issue of front-loading primaries. Um, we didn't see this as much in the last couple rounds, but for a while there, states were sort of competing with each other as to who would have the earliest primaries because they thought that would give them more of a role in uh, determining who actually won the Democratic nomination or the Republican nomination. Um, the political parties have 
at the national level have kind of stepped in to discourage this. And then also in 2016, both the Democrats and the Republicans had a primary season that went longer than folks thought. So those primaries that were later on in the cycle ended up being more important than people thought. The major party nomination contest culminates at the two um, national conventions. As I said before, it used to be that delegates went to these national conventions and they actually selected who was going to be their nominee. They might look and see how they did in the primaries, but that wasn't um, the deciding factor. Now, the primaries determine the delegates and the delegates will determine who gets the nomination. So we tend to know going into the convention who's going to come out of it with the nomination. Now, uh, theoretically, it could be close enough where one candidate did not enjoy a majority of the delegates, um, did not win the nomination on the first round of votes, and then there's kind of jockeying among the delegates. That, at that point, they, may, they can switch their position. Um, now, this is all theoretical. We haven't seen this since 1952, um, back when the, um, the state presidential primaries were not as important. So, but theoretically, that could happen. The Democratic Party has um, something the Republicans don't, which they have uh, super delegates. They have delegates that are there that are not reflective of who won, who won um, the state primary, but also some delegates that are there just because they're prominent Democrats. They are uh, mayors, they are governors, and so forth. So theoretically, if there was a very close race, the super delegates within the Democratic Party might be able to sway it one way or another. It's for that reason Bernie Sanders said that the process was fixed, even though Hillary Clinton actually ended up going in with the majority of delegates and would have won with or without the superdelegates, but she did enjoy the support of elites within um, the party. Um, Republicans, like I said, don't have superdelegates as part of their system. For the most part, though, the two parties' national conventions run similar. Um, you know, again, the Democrats and Republicans are going to, they have some different rules. For example, um, on the Democratic side, they require much more uh, gender balance and a uh, greater role for people who are of minority backgrounds and that kind of stuff. There aren't the same extent of rules on the Republican side. Um, in both situations, there are um, a credentials committee that will determine who actually gets seated in the Republican Party, who actually gets seated in the Democratic uh, national convention and there has been times and you can look to your reading for this where there's been a question as to whether or not someone um, uh, an individual delegate has the right to be seated into the convention um, in addition to selecting the nominee of their political party political conventions also they provide a platform for other prominent candidates um, Barack Obama for example got his first national exposure in the 2004 um, uh, Democratic National Convention. Um, also, they finalized the party platform, and that's what the political party stands for. You know, whether or not they're pro-choice or they're pro-life, whether they seek an expansion of Second Amendment rights or they want uh, more gun control. Uh, these are all things that will ultimately compose the, the uh, political party's platform, and those will be determined also at the National Convention. Okay, we've explored this a bit already, but as you know, uh, once the Democrats determine their nominee, once the Republicans determine their nominee for president, we don't have a national election. Um, the election is determined through the Electoral College. Each state gets a certain number of electoral votes, and that's based on their total numbers of representatives in Congress. So it's the Senate plus the House. So every state in the United States has two senators, no matter what, because the Senate treats each state equally. And the House is based on population. So the state of Minnesota has eight members of the House, two members of the Senate. That gives us 10 electoral college votes. And in all states in the United States, but two, it's winner take all, which means that you either get in the state of Minnesota all 10 of those electoral college votes or none. Um, and that means, and that obviously creates the conditions where somebody can win in the Electoral College and lose the popular election. And as many of you know, that happened in uh, 2016. And in fact, Hillary Clinton won by a large margin, what, about 2.8 million votes, and yet still lost in the Electoral College. The reading goes into the reasons for this, but this has happened five times over the course of American history. 
The margins have never been as large as they were last time, um, but we certainly have seen this in the past. So I hope uh, that we can continue this discussion on the Electoral College. Let's explore why the framers decided on the system and discussion and whether you think it ought to be um, reformed today. All right, let's uh, discuss who turns out to vote and what factors influence voter turnout. Age, generally, the older you are, the more likely you are to vote. We see that senior citizens in the United States are much more likely to vote than people in their 20s. Uh, educational attainment is very important. Higher levels of education, the more likely you are to participate in elections. And this is closely associated with income. Um, higher levels of education generally means higher levels of income. And that also is positively associated with um, uh, participation in elections and voting. Minority status. Uh, generally, minority groups, and in particular groups that compose uh, higher numbers of recent immigrants who are now citizens, we tend to see they vote at lower levels. There's a lot of reasons for that, but um, just certain social norms around voting ha has yet to be developed. Um, if you take a look at African Americans, African Americans tend to vote at about the same level as European descendant white Americans. Um, however, Hispanic Americans are voting at um, lower levels. That's one of the reasons why people who look at demographic data, they would argue that once um, Hispanic Americans start to vote at the same level as African Americans or European descent Americans, that's going to have a big impact on who wins the elections. Also, we tend to see a big difference between midterm elections and presidential elections. Presidential election cycles, you see much more interest, you see much more voter participation, midterm elections, uh, those federal elections between presidential elections have lower levels of turnout. Um, how we vote also matters a lot in who turns out to vote. <clears throat> how hard do we make it? Do we have the voting booths just open nine to five on the Tuesday of the election? Or can people vote early in the morning till late at night? Can people vote several days in advance? Um, can you vote by mail automatically? Can you request an absentee ballot? All of this stuff really matters. Um, if you restrict the ability for folks to vote into a pretty tight window or you make it hard for people to register to vote, um, you're going to exclude folks from minority backgrounds. You're going to exclude young people. In some places, you're going to uh, exclude people who are a lot older, who no longer drive or might not have a driver's license. Now, there's a lot... Uh, there's been many suggestions that we see voter fraud in the United States. There's almost no data to suggest that we see it at a, at a, at a substantial level. Um, but in many cases, people suggest we need to have tighter rules to eliminate fraud. Um, I guess the thing that I would suggest to you is, in many cases, more restrictive laws make it harder for eligible voters to vote. Um, but in many cases, it's it's unclear whether or not they're actually eliminating the same number of fraudulent cases. So sometimes we might make it hard for a million people to vote in order to pre prevent, you know, a handful of cases of fraud. Um, that's not to say that there isn't a legitimate reason to make sure people are who they say they are. There's just a lot of ways that we can do that. Uh, for example, what kind of identification do we allow? Do we just say DMV? Do you allow military identification? Do you allow student identification? Uh, do you allow one of your neighbors in your community to vouch for you? Are there, are there other ways that we can determine identification besides something that might make it harder for, for some parts of the population to vote? This is just an illustration of what I just explored of the difference between midterm and presidential election cycles. Just a little graph that looks at voter participation as a comparison among different countries. And we see that a lot of other countries have higher levels of voter participation relative to the United States. One of the reasons is our winner-take-all election system. So there's a lot of wasted votes in our system. If you're in a proportional representation system and your political party gets 10% of the votes, they still get 10% 10 of the legislature. They still get 10% of parliament. Um, which means that you still have a voice, whereas in the United States, it really discourages minor parties. <clears throat> also, in those states uh, that are really heav heavily Democratic or Republican, a lot of people might say, well, you know, what, what point is there uh, for me to participate? We also see a number of these uh, other countries have 
um, mandatory or compulsory voting, which means that you get a small fine if you don't participate in the election. And that's kind of an interesting uh, strategy. All right, we explored what influences people to actually participate in the election. Now, how do voters actually decide? Well, <clears throat> party identification is key, obviously. If you are a self-described uh, Democrat, you're a self-described Republican, you're much more likely to support those candidates. As we explored last time, more and more people are self-describing as independents, but even those situations, we tend to see a clear trend on what party that they'll support. Perception of the candidates matter. In the last election cycle, there was a very negative perception of both uh, major party candidates. We'll see if that's the case in 2020. But in that case, you know, kind of who do you like the least uh, or who do you dislike the least, I should say. Um, but historically, the candidate that was seen as the more likable was much more likely to actually win the election. Uh, issue preferences also plays a part. So there was a number of people in the last election cycle who said, well, maybe Donald Trump isn't my favorite candidate, but I like where he stands on Supreme Court nominees. I like where he stands on immigration or whatever. Um, so in that situation, you might have people who maybe didn't like the particular candidate, but like where they stood on issues. Uh, we talked about the demographic characteristics of both political parties already, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but make sure that you uh, have an understanding there. All right, to sum up, the legal qualifications for holding political office in the United States are minimal and tend not to reflect the demographics of actual office holders. Campaign contributions are increasingly made not through <clears throat> official donations to a political party or candidates, but through political action committees, super PACs, issue advocacy groups, charitable organizations. And this is done to evade limitations on uh, how much you can give or how much a, a corporate corporation or an interest group can give, and also to maintain, uh, to, to be more anonymous so people don't actually have to take responsibility for their contributions. A presidential primary is a statewide election to help a political party determine its presidential nominee. To be eligible to vote in the United States, a person must satisfy certain things, like they must register to vote in most American states, they have to be a citizen, they have to be 18 or older, they have to be a resident. Um, and the rules that we have around elections, uh, how restrictive do we make voter ID, how restrictive do we make registration, how long do we leave the, the polling places open, do we allow for absentee ballots, do we allow to vote by mail, all of this impacts overall participation for eligible voters. Okay, well, lastly, here are your discussion questions for the week. They'll also be posted in the weekly discussion area. Um, make sure to follow the grading rubric that's under materials and content. Uh, one substantial original post. Make sure to draw on concepts and examples from assigned reading. And at least two responses to your classmates' on-topic posts. Um, make sure that you've got something to add when you're responding to your classmates' post. If you don't, select uh, a different one to respond to. You may also choose to discuss this week's assigned film. And the film, too, is fair game for your next analysis paper. Have a great week. Reach out to me with any questions or concerns. And, of course, I also have my Zoom office hours. Have a good one.